So our uh, next uh, uh, keynote speaker uh, is uh, Shiri Bresnitz, uh, who, as Merrick said, is also from uh, the University of Toronto and has stepped in to uh, take over uh, some of his uh, research uh, interests in the role of universities. So she's in, in the Monk School and in the Innovation Policy Lab uh, at the University of Toronto and uh, has worked extensively on the role of universities in, uh, in regional innovation. So we look forward to hearing uh, her talk. Please, Shiri. Okay. Good morning, and uh, thank you, uh, Runa and the organizer, for inviting me here. It's uh, always exciting to be at the Geography of Innovation Conference. I think it's a really good mix of people from different disciplines that are interested in innovation. And what I want to talk to you today is uh, a little bit move us from uh, Merrick's presentation on the role of the university, and a little bit uh, tell you how my interests have moved from the role of the university to talk more about how the university and the students are engaged in entrepreneurship. So, if you think about uh, what's the most important source in today's economy, and we heard uh, in previous presentations yesterday about the importance of intangibles, right? Intangibles are now uh, represent 90, more than 90% of our economies, right? And in the center of this is knowledge. Um, the importance of university is being a mobilizer of knowledge. And universities have done it, you know, forever. <laughs> in the past, though, they mostly worked on, you know, teaching and basic research. Those were tr the traditional roles of the university. Uh, but over the years, Universities have added many, many other roles. There was a point we, we said the third role of university. Marianne Feldman and I decided three is not enough, so we made five. Um, but, you know, policy development, we heard from Professor Gertler how the university was a crucial part in the development of all these different organizations within Toronto. Um, the university is engaged in uh, knowledge transfer. There's economic initiatives. This new building that we are building is going to change that entire part of town. And you know, we, it's not just about the real estate itself. It's about being a place where people can share ideas, where they are, you know, you change the entire um, way that even the street looks, right? In New Haven, Connecticut, Yale's investment in uh, real estate changed the entire section of the city from um, areas where you did not want to walk at night, uh, to a very welcoming area of coffee shop, music, galleries, places you want to visit. So if we think about knowledge, knowledge mobilization, we, and I'm talking to all of us, but including me specifically, if my book out here, tend to focus on universities, not on students. Why? Let's face it, it's easier. Um, if you, we look at quantifiable data, that's available, that's not subjective. You have patents, licenses, uh, even spin-outs. We can show a direct connection between that and the university. But with students, it's much more difficult. Universities don't collect information on students' intellectual property. It's not in our mandate. And uh, as Professor Gertler can tell you, when he gives talks, and I've seen him give talk, give talk, and other presidents give talk. You know, one of the first things they all say is we're talking about how many patents we have, how many licenses we have, how many spin we have, because that's what we can quantify. So if you look, though, at more recent research, it actually shows us that students, you know, all of our students, not even just the graduate students, contribute directly to our economy. Um, the, the work by... Astebro and his colleagues showed that you know, universities' major impact is through their student startups. And the UK, and I have to look at this because the name is too long, the UK Annual Higher Education Business and Community Interaction Survey from 2015-16 showed that uh, students established 15 times more spin-outs than faculty. Um, and the most uh, 
recent kind of studies that I uh, have to say I've been playing with that as well. Uh, alumni impact surveys uh, also show you how many more startups are created by students. But, you know, when, initially when we think about students, we think about the fact that we are training them for the workshop, wor workforce, sorry. Whether it is, uh, you know, in the labs or on, on the jobs and firms uh, like the ones we've heard before. But some of the most influential firms were created on campus, never finished their degrees, but still created on campus. And some of the most, uh, almost all the founders of today's top companies are university graduates. You know, it's nice to talk the talk about, you know, you do not need an academic degree, but the fact is, it is part of your life. It helps you create the network that a lot of you are studying, right? And provides you with the social capital that enables you to create companies. So I wanna go through some of the changes that are happening within universities to include entrepreneurship. So in the teaching part, we have now, we do teach entrepreneurship as a subject, right? On top of the regular subjects that we teach, so the traditional teaching. But we also teach entrepreneurship. So we provide, as, a, as institutions, the universities provide uh, entrepreneurship courses. There are over 3,000 institutions all around the world that are teaching both for credit and certificate program in entrepreneurship. If you look at entrepreneurship as a subject, it's probably one of the most uh, uh, topics that grew exponentially over time. And it's not just taught at business schools. It is taught in every other in interdisciplinary department. We have um, accelerators, incubators. We have regional agencies, such as Vector in, in Toronto itself. We have several regional innovation centers that teach entrepreneurship and teach our um, uh, entrepreneurs not just the basic business of how to develop a firm and you know what are the basic, but really change the way you think about how to become an entrepreneur. So I want us to talk a little bit on, on both of these sides. So if you start from something like traditional teaching, we heard from Mercedes yesterday about the importance of STEM education, right? So if you look at the importance of STEM education, we know that STEM graduates are viewed as major drivers uh, in technological innovation. And we have studies that show that they are vital to develop uh, technologies, uh, disease preventation, climate change. Um, all the high-tech sectors have a high proportion of share of STEM workers. But uh, they are less likely than non-STEM counterparts to become entrepreneurs. So if you look at these and you go, okay, hold on, wait a second. Do we need STEM graduates to have startups? Or do we not need STEM graduates? So wh what's the right mix here? So in this paper that we have uh, published in uh, Small Business Economics, um, to, I published together with uh, Chen Zhang, who's my postdoc, and now he's unfortunately back in uh, China at the University of Liverpool in Shizu. Um, we, we have... Uh, try to look at this diverse background versus STEM. If you look at study, you know, they show that entrepreneurs tend to be more generalist rather than specialist, that you need this kind of a diverse education. In uh, one of the videos I like to show my students, you hear a former interview with Steve Jobs where he explains that if he would not be taking calligraphy lessons, there would be no beautiful fonts that we all use today he would have never thought of adding them to his Macintosh program, right? And he talks a lot about how in the beginning, especially, they had, um, they still have at Apple, zoologists, um, you know, theater and drama graduates, because you need all of these people, designers, to create our really slick new iPhones that we keep changing every year. So, the other part of this equation is the discussion on international students. There is this kind of an agreement that international students are more likely to transition into entrepreneurship than their domestic counterparts, right? 
Uh, being an international student myself, I'm obviously not a good example. <laughs> uh, even doing it several times did not help. But um, if you look at that, you could, there's, there could be several reasons. One, it could be that international students are just people who actually have the resources to move around the globe and then more likely to become entrepreneur. Or we can think about it more like Saxenian or Ajay Agarwal who say, this is all about cross-body mobility. This is about the movement and knowledge absorption that people receive when they're going around. So in this paper, we were looking at the STEM background, the diverse degree, and looking at foreign education. And the important part here is because we had data from the University of Toronto Alumni Impact Survey that we've done in 2017, we had all the education of these people. So not just what they have studied at U of T, but we asked them to provide all of their degrees from any university they have been all around the world. And um, we looked at, we analyzed the data looking at two things. One, at the creation of startups. So any, this could be for-profit or not-for-profit companies, right? So, you know, we talked about the need to not just focus on the high-tech and for-profit firms. And we also looked specifically at the for-profit and trying to understand which one of these variables had a um, better impact. And what we find is that STEM degrees has a significant negative impact on startup creation. Now, it shouldn't surprise you, right? As we've seen just in the previous presentation, if you have a STEM degree, all these big companies, multinationals, they grab you. You don't need to work so hard and create your own company. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of risk. And if you can have the same position without this headache, why would you, right? Um, then the combination of STEM and non-STEM is positive, not significant. Um, but for me, the most exciting part of it was the foreign education experience. Because a lot of the studies that I've read talk about the international students, international students moving in, because that's the data we usually have on our own university. But from this data set, we actually were able to see that it doesn't matter if you are Canadian or you're an international student. If you have an international experience, education, somewhere else, then you are more likely to become an entrepreneur. Um, we actually have taken it further and we have done a second service that I'm hoping to show you in the next, you know, maybe next time you invite me to give a talk. Because well, now we have their entire employment information, which is some of them were very upset because they said, you know, I worked in 14 jobs and now you're asking me to write all of them. And they said, I don't, you know, just give me something. But it's going to be very interesting to see whether the jobs themselves, so it's, maybe it's not just about education, maybe it's just about the international experience of working in different places. And lastly, just because of uh, Mercedes' presentation yesterday, I took out some of the control variable and showed, you know, female students uh, fall behind male counterpart in entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, this works in no matter how we flip this data. Um, so, okay, so now we talked about the traditional part of education, teaching, uh, teaching traditional education like STEM. What about teaching entrepreneurship? Um, if you look at the studies on entrepreneurship, and this was new for me, so I was reading all this material, and most of the studies talk about entrepreneurship intentions. You take an entrepreneurship course, you, at the end of it, you know, they give you a survey, and at the end of the survey you say, yes, this actually makes me think that I might want to be an entrepreneur. Yay, that's great. But at the end of the day, it really doesn't tell us much on these people, whether they actually establish firm or do not establish firm. And the literature on uh, f firm creation is very little. Actually, a majority of it comes from Scandinavia and uh, um, from specific people who actually looked at uh, an entrepreneurship program and followed their students over a few years. The, the only issue with that is that it's only one program, right? It doesn't give us a lot of way to ge generalize. So. In this new paper that I'm working on now uh, with, with Chen, is, uh, we're looking at three things. We're looking at the creation of firms, and this can be any firm. Um, at U of T, people will tell you we are, as I learned, uh, probably the biggest producers of pharmacists, lawyers, and dentists 
in Ontario or in Canada, actually, because at one point we were the only pharmacy program, right? So this includes even those kinds of offices, okay? Then we're looking specifically at the creation of high-tech firms. And that's because, and I'll show you this, studies talk about the connection, for example, with STEM and, uh, uh, and high-tech. And lastly, we wanted to look specifically at student firms, right? Student, and we, we, um, we define it as people who created a firm sometimes in uh, um, a time frame of five years before or uh, after graduation. Sorry. So adding to the alumni impact survey that we've done in 2017, we did an, a follow-up survey in 2018 where we asked about employment, but we all specifically asked them about entrepreneurship courses, both at universities, but also outside the university. As Merck said, you know, we have a really vibrant ecosystem for innovation in Toronto. So trying to understand how much of it is really about the university or about the ecosystem that is around the university. Um, and so specifically, we differentiate between four credit courses at universities and you know, extracurricular activity. What we find is that taking entrepreneurship courses, okay, in comparison to not taking courses at all, has a positive impact on entrepreneurship in general, but specifically on student entrepreneurs, which is very interesting does not have the same impact on the high-tech entrepreneurs. Um, and then, of course, the degree. So everybody talks about the computer science uh, and engineer students, and of course, the management students. What we find is that computer science and engineering is a positive for general entrepreneurship. But the gr graduate students, who are also management students, are more likely to create companies uh, while they're actually students. We also see that the source matters. So university courses are not enough for high-tech firms. This is for the next speech, Merrick, so you cannot say that, that we are creating the high-tech companies. But you can say we are contributing to entrepreneurship. Um, and of course, it shows really nicely the reliance on the ecosystem. Because entrepreneurship courses taken from all these intermediary organizations uh, has a positive relations with, in, with high technology and com entrepreneurship. And also the combination of university entrepreneurship courses together with the intermediary courses. Um, and of course, um, this uh, connects with some of the literature and what we know about the importance of computer science engineering. Now, what I want to move now is into all these services that the University of Toronto uh, provides, or actually universities provide in general. And uh, we have colleagues that have looked already into this idea of the university as an ecosystem on its own. Uh, Mike Wright, who passed away unfortunately in, in the fall, has a beautiful piece looking specifically and defining what is the ecosystem of the university and what are the different parts. And even if you think about it, even, I don't know, 15 years ago, we wouldn't be able to find most of these activities within universities. So this is a, a really big change. But we don't have a lot of research to go back to our administra administrators and tell them, oh, you know what, all of this investment it's actually worth it, right? We don't know that information. So in this paper that we published this year in uh, um, in the Industrial and, and Corporate Change, what we said, we looked at is what is the best way for university to invest in, um, in entrepreneurship? If you look at a lot of the accelerators, incubators, if you look at in each and every one of your town, you have them in your institution and you have them outside the institution. Here in Stavanger, there's a really successful accelerator, smack down next to the university. Each of these is very, very different. They provide different services, um, they teach differently, 
their definition of entrepreneurship is very different. We do not have, even within UFT, an agreement of what is the right formula to do this. So these are the accelerators at UFT. Um, this is not a mistake, you're not seeing double. We have 11 accelerators on the UFT campus. Now to our defense, it took me uh, many years to get this, University of Toronto is very big. We have 90,000 students, okay, and two suburban campuses, but still we are in one uh, metropolitan area, okay, and there are 11 accelerators. Uh, until last year we, ha we had nine, so we just last year we developed two more. And they are very different from one another about on, on what they offer and what they specialize in and what kind of services they provide. So the first accelerator was created uh, at the, the Faculty of Engineering, the Hatchery, uh, in 2011. And the last one uh, that, that went into our studies was the Health Innovation Hub uh, that was created in the Faculty of Medicine. Just as an exa example, two very different ones. The health innovation one has very few companies, well, not even companies, you can't even call them companies because these are, most of them, PhD and postdoc students that have an idea of something that might be commercial, okay? Where the hatchery, these are, some of them are even undergraduates who have very particular idea, they go for a very um, um, rigid program, and at the end of it, they have to leave. On the other hand, we have something like the hub, which is in our suburban campus, and it's really just a space. They call it accelerator, but it's really just a space, and there's somebody that you can ask some questions, but there really is no program, um, no, no, no real mentorship, no investment in your company or anything of the sort. So when, when I came to U of T seven years ago and I looked at this, I was like, this is really puzzling. Right, they came from Georgia Tech. We had one big accelerator, very successful one, had different programs for different things. And I'm trying to understand what is all of this? And even when I spoke to people at administrator, <laughs> they weren't very sure about explaining to me what's the difference between all of this. But I'm thinking about it as the university. It, this is a lot of investment. Yes, it was done with the support from the provincial government that ended this year because we have a change of government, so they decided this program is not needed anymore. Uh, but you know, the government provided 20 million, three million of it went into U, U of T accelerators, okay? So how do we make a decision on what is a good service and are we really contributing to these companies? What we find is that there are um, the selection process, Okay, so this is crucial. If you talk to uh, a lot of accelerators and incubators, some of them are just, you know, we have the space, you want to come and sit here, and maybe you want to sit next to other companies and talk to them, you know, you help each other, it's wonderful, you have the right environment, where others have actual a selection process. Now, since I'm not a Canadian yet, I can say that, we're talking about selection. It's very hard to talk selection in Canada. Everybody is supposed to get everything, right? But you know, if you come from business schools, you know that one of the first things they tell you, you need to pick, you need to pick winners. Not everybody is going to make it. And the study showed that accelerators that actually select, firms that went to accelerators that have a selection process are more likely to grow, both by number of employees and by number of products. Um, the other two important categories were the director of the center. You need a serial entrepreneur. Not an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur. Now, you're all looking at me and go, yeah, right. What serial entrepreneur is going to come and work at the university, right? Well, we have actually, we have a few of them. And if you don't have the serial entrepreneur, you need to have them at least as mentors like the Creative Destruction Lab has, which is a, not a total story that needs to be told on its own. It's not your typical accelerator. Um, but you can see why, right? Each and every company hits different obstacles in different levels, uh, you know, different paths. And so, and especially in a university like Toronto, where we are so diverse, 
and people come from different disciplines, it's really important to, to have somebody who has the experience, who understands where we're going, and pro can provide some connection, but also critical advice to the products and, uh, and the company's growth. Uh, and last but not least is the program. First of all, having a program is important, but also uh, having a program that has milestones, um, doesn't let you st stick around in the space because you know, you've seen it. We have a lot of these companies in Accelerator. It's really our postdoc projects, I call them. They're not really a, a company because they, nobody's kicking them out. They have no reason really to fight over uh, achievement or the next goal or you know, uh, making it up now. We also ask all of these um, uh, companies, you know, what is the most important service that you received? And, it, and interestingly, the, the most important service is guidance from accelerator stuff. So now we go back to the fact that you need an entrepreneurial director. Because if you do not get the proper guidance, you have a problem. And I can tell you now as a side story to all of this, I'm sitting now on a, on a provincial panel looking at intellectual property in Ontario, specifically on intellectual property from universities. We had a lot of push from government to come to the university and say, you're, you're not doing your job. And my point to them was, well, they don't own the IP in Canada, so you can't point your fingers to anybody at this stage. But importantly, we've done a lot of consultation through this process, and we talked to a lot of tech transfer offices and to companies. And what comes out in all these interviews is, well, the mentor told me I don't need, an, I do, I don't need a patent. Software, if you have a software company, you don't need a patent. It's more important to get to the market. Now you go and you talk to the patent lawyers and they go like, oh my God, how can you do that? One of our biggest successful companies in Canada now is Shopify. Shopify until about six months ago had no patents. And they thought they're doing great, right? The, the problem is you do great until you are very successful and then oops, everybody's on to you. And you get sued. And we can, that's another totally different debate on whether patents are important or not important. The important part here is the advice you get and how and the level of uh, knowledge that the people at the accelerator provide for you. So what I wanted to do today is really to talk to you about entrepreneurship and whether entrepreneurship is, if you'd like, old wine in new bottles, right? But for me, the answer is no. Because it's not just that we teach entrepreneurship as a traditional topic. We do that. But universities today are in constant pressure to provide uh, um, services that help nurture and create companies. This is, you know, if you look at the traditional roles of universities, like the, if there was a manual of, you know, how to manage university, it's not in the manual. We're not supposed to do that. You know, nobody told us, oh, now it's your next role is to help connect these students with people at companies or give them advice on how to apply for government grants for their, you know, ideas. It's not, it's not the traditional role of the university, but we have more and more uh, services that universities are providing. And um, the impact on students, it's not anymore about Oh, we're teaching you, we're giving you, um, you know, even that was actually a, a progress that we made, like we're preparing you for the job market, right? Some, actually some very traditional science department at U of T still don't have, they, they're not able to tell their students where they can get jobs. You know, but it's something we are doing. But if you think about the plethora of services that we provide now, both for our students and faculty, the university now is this engine of entrepreneurship. And I know it's hard for us to think about, and, and maybe that's the questions for us to, to discuss, whether it's good or bad. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not taking sides here. But as a fact, you have students that come into a university, and even, even U of T, with all of our um, uh, knowledge and history in AI, do you think they would come if we don't have now an institute like the Vector Institute? Or access to companies like Google or Uber? And I can tell you in Toronto it's a big, big discussion because a lot of the 
uh, Canadian companies complain that, oh, we are working on all this knowledge at the public university, and it all goes away to Google and Uber, right? So that's another part. We can discuss that too. But um, I hope I at least stimulated you a bit to think about uh, entrepreneurship at universities and whether it's good and bad, and I would welcome questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, Shiri. So uh, again, we have time for some questions from the audience. David Charles, Northumbria University. Um, you mentioned international students at one point about their success in entrepreneurship. Was that they stayed in Toronto to set up new businesses or when they went back home to their home countries? And if they stayed in Toronto, what does it say about the importance of immigration uh, procedures to allow students to stay in their, uh, the places that they adopt as home? So we, we have both. We, you have both uh, students that stayed and left, and you also have Canadians that went and studied abroad and either came back to Toronto or, or Canada and left. So we, we didn't do it on the city level, we did it on the country level, and you see the same, it's the same proportion. So it's really just about the, the foreign education experience, at least until I know about their employment experience. And, uh, but I agree with you, so it's, you know, uh, in Canada, it's pretty, you, you become a permanent resident very fast. In two years, you can apply for permanent residence, which is really amazing, you know, if you think about uh, the UK or the US regulation. You know, as somebody who's been on visas for, you know, I don't know, half my life, this is an amazing change. And it's, it really changes also the perspective for a lot of people because they feel like they, this is a place where they can build a home. If you catch them pretty early, if you think about, you know, most graduate students take... Uh, you know, by the time they finish their PhDs, they're sometimes in their mid-30s, they already have a family. It's harder for them to move. We know that from studies, right? So if you caught them early on and they now are, are uh, citizens, it's a, I, I do agree, but I don't, we don't have this data. Yeah. Hi, Ernest Migueles from Bordeaux. Um, my question was about uh, social mobility and whether there is, because there is this literature in innovation on who becomes innovator, or who becomes an inventor in the, in the States, and basically concluding that large part of it is the socioeconomic status mm -hmm. of the family and so on. And so I was wondering whether there are also these kind of literature studies on entrepreneurship and what would be the role. If it has an important role, what would be the real effect of a university in channeling entrepreneurship? So yes, so the literature in entrepreneurship does have an entire section on the personal tariffs and environmental um, effects of you know, the person while they grow, he or she grow up, right? So the family does matter. Uh, the only difference is uh, University of Toronto does not give me uh, any access to their financials. So, and, and you, you know, it's not something you can ask them how much money you came from or whether you are, you know, have, have the experience. What we do have is some information if whether they had, uh, you know, family business in, you know, but that e doesn't even tell you whether they have actually the financial capability. It just give, maybe gives you a little more of that they had the entrepreneurial background. But the literature does say a lot about not just the environmental, but also the personal tariffs of who becomes an entrepreneur. Okay, anyone else? Yes. Uh, thanks, Shiri. Uh, Kieran Flanagan from the University of Manchester. Yeah, really enjoyed the talk. Uh, in our university, there's a lot of entrepreneurship um, initiatives, and it is it is a mix of um, for credit courses and university organised extracurricular activities. So I just wonder what you know implications that the fact the university is involved in both. Uh, what implications that would have for your kind of um, method, you know, your distinction between the two. I think, I guess, I, if I understood correctly, you're assuming that the extracurricular is mainly outside the university. So, good question. No, we also we also uh, looked at the extracurricular within the university. So they were asked for specific entrepreneurship for credit courses within the university and extracurricular courses or certificates in entrepreneurship at the university because of we have all these accelerators, right? It didn't help then 
90-year-old people who answered the survey, but <laughs> it did help for our students, yes. And then we also tested for the combination of the different kinds of courses. Yeah. Okay, we have time for maybe one more. Uh, if there's any final questions. Yes. So given that you have the president of your university in front of you, I'm just wondering, <laughs> what's your sort of one ask from or the one implication for him from your research? My implication? Important. Well, I think, it's <laughs> I think it's very clear, though. You have to understand the University of Toronto is, is, is more like of a Cambridge and Oxford in, in that way, that it's very decentralized. So the part of the reason we have so many accelerators is the dean of different faculty can create, they have their own budget, they can create their own uh, accelerator. So this is really doesn't uh, fall specifically under Merrick, and I think he's very happy for it. <laughs> but, uh, but I can tell you, the vice president of research is very interested in that, and we are talking about the fact that we do need to provide an entrepreneurship course that is similar all across, and we should provide an intellectual property course that is available for everybody because of this mismatch, and you can say, oh, but I went to University of Toronto and I took this course, but uh, no, you actually took it in you know, the hatchery or you took it at the hub, it's really not the same. So we're going to let the president respond to that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this is incredibly valuable work for us. We've learned so much about our own local ecosystem through the work that Sherry has done. The, the survey that she referred to, the alumni impact survey, was um, an instrument that we um, launched a few years ago as, a, as the first ever attempt by the university to actually track, it's hard to believe this, actually track where our alumni go and what they do. We've never done it before. We have over 600,000 alumni around the world in, at last count, 193 countries. Mm -hmm. And so this, this huge latent asset, we knew nothing about them. And you know, we found ourselves in a position where we needed to be able to say some evidence-based things about what our alumni do, the contributions that they make to Toronto, to Canada, et cetera, or to the world. Um, the ability of students who don't come from STEM disciplines to actually make useful contributions to the economy, which is, you know, frankly and sadly, an argument that we find ourselves having to make all the time. Mm -hmm. And the kind of information that Sherry helped us, and Sherry was uh, the architect of this survey, uh, the kind of information that we now have available is phenomenally useful, mm -hmm. not just for informing the kind of work that mm -hmm. she's doing, but for so much of our advocacy and our own planning. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's been hugely useful. Um, and, you know, we've, we ask things about not just, you know, businesses they've created, but contributions to their communities, charitable work. And the, the, you know, the thousands of hours that our um, graduates devote to uh, volunteer activities in their communities every year. It's just, so we've got all kinds of really interesting data. Um, but on, on this uh, question of you know, the 11 accelerators and so on, Shiri is right. I mean, we're a very decentralized place. Uh, almost, but perhaps not quite as decentralized as Oxbridge. But, uh, similar kind of history. So that explains in part why you have a thousand flowers or at least 11 flowers blooming. Um, and to be honest, I think, although uh, you know, it's always easier to sort of argue this ex post, there was some logic in experimenting because frankly we were learning by doing. Yeah. And you allow 11, what well, was originally nine of these things with a bit of government support uh, to, uh, to pop up and see what happens. So we've got, I mean, the nice news is that there's enough variation in the approaches of these 11 cases that Sherry can distill some really interesting and useful uh, inferences of the sort that you heard her uh, uh, share Perfect with us study. a few minutes Perfect. ago. Yeah. The other thing I <laughs> wanted to point out is that we have seen, and I, I, I'd be interested in Sherry's view on this, we have anecdotal evidence at least to um, indicate that entrepreneurs move from one to another to another. So a lot of these, as she says, are not selective in any way. You know, They're supportive, but they're not really selective. But many of them will graduate, or at least a significant number of them will graduate, say, from that thing in the Faculty of Medicine or that thing in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering to the Creative Destruction Lab, which is kind of at the, I don't know if you would agree with this characterization, the pinnacle mm -hmm. in, sense, in, in the sense of the rigor 
and the, um, the difficulty of entry. And it's a bit like a shark tank, you know, it's, it's uh, very much a kind of a, a tough love kind of experience, but they have a great track record of scaling up um, enterprises. And many of those are graduates of other accelerators or incubators elsewhere uh, in the university. And just on, the, on the, the, the last point that Shiri made in her talk about you know, the controversy around whether the university's publicly funded IP is ending up just in the hands of Google and Uber, that was one of the motivations behind Vector. So you saw the list of companies, and it does include indeed Google and Uber, but there's a lot of those big Canadian firms that are, are benefiting from their um, access to the IP or the, the, the uh, intellectual talent inside the Vector Institute and a lot of small and medium-sized Canadian-based enterprise. And that, that too was a, you know, that point that Shiri made was a very important motivation behind uh, the foundation and the formation of Uber. Okay. Pardon me, a Vector, not Uber. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much and uh, please give a hand.